South Florida. It's home to crystal clear beaches, world famous nightlife and world class dining. A place where many people come to escape and for some sunny weather and permanent vacation vibes. Well, there's nothing like a global pandemic to put an end to the party. When Governor Ron DeSantis issued an executive order on April 1st, shutting down all non-essential businesses, our world stopped. But that didn't stop some. During this timeout, we also took time out to assemble a list of the people we find the most fascinating this year. So as we prepare to close the door on 2020, Let's take a look back on a few incredible South Floridians, some who made the news across the nation, and some who simply make us proud. They have each found a way to leave an eternal footprint in the fabric of our beloved South Florida and beyond. I'm Kavita Shane, and this is our seven most fascinating people of South Florida. Who exactly is David Einhorn, AKA Poppy from Poppy Steak? Well, one publicist said off the record, I think he did real estate in New York. Now his past may be a mystery to some, but what is clear is the man knows how to make steak. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And entertain those enjoying it. Poppy is part of the inner circle of another David, Grutman, who put the Poppy steak on his menu at Komodo, which since day one has been one of the best sellers at the Swanky Eatery. Now, Grutman and Einhorn then gave the popular dish its own stage with the opening of Poppy Steak in Miami Beach, part of Grutman's ever-expanding root hospitality empire. Now, that was September 2019, and the meteoric rise was swift, attracting a parade of celebrities, including Michael Bay, Drake, French Montana, J-Lo, Trevor Noah, and DJ Khaled. But six months after opening, enter a global pandemic and shockwaves across the restaurant industry. So let's hear from the man behind the big beef and how he's navigating business amidst COVID-19. So are you the guy that throws the apron on? Are you the guy that makes sure when people walk in the door, they're taken care of? I'm everything. From the second somebody makes a reservation at Poppy Steak till the second they walk out their door and into their car, you have to make sure that their experience is perfection. You grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Yeah. What was it like growing up in a conservative Jewish household? It was actually a little more than conservative. It was actually orthodox Jewish household. I took a lot out from that rich tradition that we have in, in, the, in the Jewish orthodox world and brought that with me today into the restaurant. Well, I heard that you have a very big family. How many brothers and sisters? We have 10 brothers and sisters, blessed, thank God. And I'm the youngest, so uh, I got a lot from everybody. <laughs> well, what brought you to stay in Miami? I always loved Miami because it's a two hour flight from New York. And whenever the weather got bad in New York, we all know that the winters, it starts snowing, it gets all snow everywhere and everything. I was on the flight out. They're like, oh, there's a storm coming. I'm like, I'm out. So I've been spending a lot of winters here since, since I was about 15. So I always loved Miami. It was always like my second home. And, and I'm happy that I have this opportunity to be a part of the community now. Well, you're not just a charming face and personality. You are a mean griller. You have your own secret sauce. Where do you get your kitchen DNA from? My mother was always very warming and being from a big family, everybody has their friends, but the door is always open. So they're bringing their friends over and my brother's friends, my sister's friends, and everybody's always together. My mom's always in the kitchen cooking and bringing out fresh food and doing this and doing that. And so you kind of have that with you. So growing up, I was always the host between all my friends. I was always the one grilling and doing the dinners and hosting dinners and inviting people over. So I love that. That, that, that's what gives me pure happiness. And the name Poppy? That's actually interesting. I have a friend, his name is Alec Monopoly. He's an artist, a very famous artist. And um, again, because I started with all the hosting and all the dinners, they were like, oh, Poppy, Poppy. And they, everybody was just calling me Poppy. And then while I was grilling these steaks, so it started like Poppy Steak. So you are partners with David Grutman, Groot Hospitality. Take us through how you met. Take us through that David David relationship partnership that you have with him. Flying down to Miami for all those years, um, going to the hottest clubs and the hottest scenes. Obviously, you run by David Grutman. And um, I became friends with his team, 
the people that work around him and we became very friendly. They started traveling to New York as well, staying by me. I was hosting them in New York. And then when I was coming here, we started hanging out. And so we got to Dave and then the steak came up because he started seeing it on my social media, the poppy steak. And I remember it was Art Basel one year and he had everybody over at his house, like every top celebrity you can think of was at his house. And Dave was like, why don't you, this is your time to shine. Let's get the poppy steaks up, let's go. So I started grilling the steaks. I got the kosher steaks over with the sauce and everything. And they went crazy. They were blown away by it. So Dave being the marketing genius that he is, he's like, we just opened up Komodo. Let's throw it up on the menu and see, see how it hits. And it became the number one selling item on that menu. Take me to the conversation that you had with David going from a menu item to its own restaurant. So that's an interesting story. We were on the way to a Tao grand opening. We were on the jet. I was with Noah Tepperberg, who is the owner of Tao Group, and we were with Dave, and we were talking about the success of the steak at Komodo and what a great success it is and how, how everybody around the world and social media is talking about it. And so Dave goes, he's like, you know, so interesting that somebody offered me a space in South of Fifth, a beautiful space, ready to go, and um, what do you think we should do there? And Noah goes, turns around, and we all were like, poppy steak. Would you consider it a kind of Jewish style steakhouse? Because you do have a lot of kosher menu items. I remember thinking that it would be amazing to be able to offer kosher items on the menu. We offer that in a beautiful vibe environment where people can really enjoy. And you've seen who comes here and all the celebrities and everybody's dressed beautifully. Like, we don't even have to enforce a dress code here because everybody knows we're going to poppy steak, we're going to look beautiful. We're going to dress up to the nines and makeup and men are wearing, you know, beautiful suits and everything. To come here and be able to have all that and have a kosher steak or a schnitzel or, or something that you can really eat and enjoy, not just the salad, that was my dream and that's what I brought with me. There's a saying, treat an ordinary person like a king and treat a king like an ordinary person. What's your philosophy on the way you treat the wave of celebrities that come through your door? Everybody's a king when they walk in over here. Kings and queens, that's all we have. Safe to say the restaurant industry was hit the hardest by the pandemic. How did you navigate this nightmare? It was a nightmare, but thank God that the second they were allow us to open up back again, that it would just, place would just pack up, which is, which is amazing it's crazy to me like they told us to shut down we had to shut these doors it broke my heart shutting these doors i never thought i would ever see it but the second they said okay we're we're allowed to open we opened the doors the place packed right back up i mean we had to do three grand openings in one year <laughs> who has to do three grand openings but we did it you guys were closed for a few months during lockdown what did you do were you active in the business and what were you doing when you weren't working so actually we wanted to keep a lot of the staff on and to be able to still pay them during the pandemic. And um, so what we did was we decided to keep going with like food tastings. And uh, actually we did a little bit of a takeout menu, but we did a lot of charity where we would go to like homes in different locations and, and uh, drop off boxes of food. Advice for other restaurants and chefs and wait staff that are struggling right now? Just keep going, just uh, wait it out. I think we're gonna get through this very soon. I'm hoping, I'm praying. Um, my prayers are with everybody that went through this hard time. We're all in it together. And uh, just, just be tough, just, just stay strong. It's gonna, it's gonna end soon and everything's gonna be back to normal. Coming up, an inspirational woman whose fingerprints are all over South Florida's skyline. And we'll hear from a South Floridian whose life-threatening battle with COVID-19 went viral. Miami's not the only spot with spectacular beaches. Many say the turquoise coloring of Fort Lauderdale's surf has the same Caribbean flair as its South Beach counterpart, attracting tourists from near and far. And now, thanks in large part to developer Ramola Matwani, they can unwind after a long day of fun and sun in style. The chairwoman of Mary Mac Ventures has spent nearly three decades expertly transforming rundown Spring Break motels into upscale hotels and condos, adding value to Fort Lauderdale, Miami, and beyond. Ramola grew up in India, completed a law degree in Mumbai, followed her love to America, and started a family. When her husband unexpectedly passed away from a brain hemorrhage, she forged ahead, taking the family business to Mammoth Heights, all while building an inspirational legacy 
that makes her a landmark in South Florida. Suddenly, you were 47 years old, you have two teenage sons, you have this business, and you said you just closed on another property, and your husband suddenly passes away, you know, young guy. How did you manage to get through such a hard time and then go on to be able to also run a business and raise your teenage sons? November 2nd, 1994. That's when I lost him. October 13th, we had just closed on Tropic K with the expanding of our vision for the future. And this was so sudden. I, obviously you are never prepared for these things, but more so, it was just too sudden for me. Um, we were soulmates. We always did everything that made each other happy. And I had two choices. Either I go, you know, I could go be grieving and I would be going down, um, or I had to look at my children and say, that's my responsibility, not just as a mother, but now I'm mother and father. Describe the first time you met Bob. My sister and his sister went to college together. So often he would come to my house to give something from his sister to my sister, a book or whatever. And he would always look at me and I didn't realize it at that time, but my sister still tells me that when he used to come, he never came to give me a book. He came to <laughs> So you went to study law in Mumbai he went off to the United States to study business, and you had a long distance relationship for quite some time. How did you manage those five years apart? And when he was leaving, he asked me uh, if I would, uh, you know, wait for him. He wanted to make sure before he got on that plane. Uh, and we decided that yes, uh, uh, we will, and we will write letter to one another every single day for five years. I mean, that's quite a lot of trips to the post office. When you are in love, you find your way. <laughs> well, eventually you did move to the United States. You guys got married in the United States. It was beautiful. Our relationship was beautiful. You went from Missouri, where you went and got your MBA, and then you took your family and you both headed down south to Fort Lauderdale for a new business venture. But everything didn't go as planned, so what happened there? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you laugh before you talk about it. Listen, life is always like how we look at it. We always looked at glass half full and always were focused on how to make that half full. So that journey, you know, when we came here, uh, spring break, it was the same year. We bought the properties, relying on the numbers. So when first season came, here we are. We are all ready. We are all charged up. We all were ready for great business. And what happened? Nothing. There was a period on the beach that everything collapsed. It was Merrimack that we decided that we believed in the location and Bob was a visionary, and he said, it's location, 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 it's beach, it has to come back, we have to bring it back. And we rolled up our sleeves. We believed in the market, and we just hung in tight, said we are going to make this happen. You pivoted from hotel management to land development, and at the time you were a rookie. So what challenges did you face when switching gears in business? when I got entitlements to Mary Mac Hotel um, of 320 room luxury hotel on the beach, on Fort Lauderdale Beach. That was huge. That was huge. I was a single owner of the block and that hit the newspaper next morning. I didn't go to Cornell. I did, and I felt like it came to me. 
I didn't go to Columbia for real estate development. <laughs> but that knowledge came to me in my office. I must have met maybe at least 100 developers from all over the world. Fast forward now to 2020, groundbreaking on the Four Seasons in 2018. Was that emotional for you? And what would Bob say now? Bob would be all smiles. <laughs> Uh, very proud, very proud of his children. And you. And of course, yeah. In my lifetime, our dream has come true. And I always think for my children, the future, that, and I always include Bob in that vision, like what would he like? And I think, you know, our children both Nitin and Dave have really made us so proud, so proud and, you know, really excelled expectations and uh, I love them dearly. It's extremely hard sometimes to get children to embrace a family business for many, yet how do you feel at having your two sons at the helm of Merrimack Ventures? You are right. It's not easy especially when your children go to New York, to a place like New York. They worked on Wall Street, they went to Columbia. It is all about right timing, right time in a right place. And that fell in place for me. It was a great thing for them to come home and pick up from, climb that ladder of development. And I always believe that Everyone should have their own wings to fly. You have won numerous awards. If I listed them, it would be probably a 10 minute long list. <laughs> so which service projects are you most passionate about? Last year, uh, we started Armatwani Academy at Robert College that I'm very passionate about. Markets can go up, they can go down, things can, challenges can come, difficulties can come, but education, always gives you, always gives you some place uh, in your future. Any plans to retire? I don't even know how to spell that word. <laughs> I knew how you were gonna answer that question, but I had to ask it anyway. I'm very thankful to God. I like a balanced life. Uh, so now that my children are doing so well, I like to give back. And I always say, God, you know, make me useful. That's why he gives me this energy and passion and desire uh, to do what's good for the community. A global pandemic right on our doorstep. Florida ranks in the top three states in the country for the most COVID-19 cases. A staggering one million Floridians and counting have been infected with the coronavirus and thousands have died from it. Now John Place dodged death and considers himself one of the lucky ones. This plantation resident tested positive for COVID-19 shortly after Father's Day when he caught it from his 21-year-old son. Now he spent 45 days in the hospital, 20 of them on a ventilator fighting for his life. But the mental and financial toll will take longer to heal. With medical bills topping $1 million, a business hit hard by the pandemic, and a newfound mission to educate others on the devastation this virus can cause, we welcome John into our list of South Florida's seven most fascinating people. I'm so glad that you're able to share your story. So if you can tell us what happened going in the hospital. The quick version of the whole COVID the thing that happened to me is my my 21 year old son he was 20 at the time uh he went out with some friends it wasn't a covid party or anything like that it was just him and four friends hung out of the house um nobody was sick or showing symptoms so they all took off their masks they had their fun uh next four days or so my son he uh he got a cold he didn't tell anybody and then about that week later my 15 year old son got a cold about two days later one of the girls from my son's gathering called and said nicholas listen um Two of us, we tested positive for COVID. You should go get checked just to be sure. And then that's when my son came to me and said, Dad, this is what happened. I'm sorry. I need you to go get tested. Ironically, you got COVID-19 on Father's Day. And that's really the last thing I remember is Father's Day. Uh, it was a great day. I, I think I was feeling a little weird or ill toward the end of the day. And it's the last thing I remember. From then on, I, I had a 104 fever for about three or four days. I couldn't breathe. 
Next thing I know, I guess I'm at the hospital. I'm texting and doing live videos and everything, but I don't remember doing it. I remember it only because I saw it on my Facebook. Um, then the doctor told my wife she has 10 minutes to decide if I'm going on a ventilator or not. So she didn't know what to do. She's asking, you know, friends that are doctors, this person doctor. She had two other doctors tell her, listen, he has a 0% chance of living. If he doesn't, he has a 20% if he does. I mean, they're not great odds, but 20% is still better than zero. So I went on the ventilator. Um, I was on the ventilator for 20 days. I was in the hospital for 45 days. Um, the, every doctor I see, even right now, they say I'm a miracle that I'm even alive. I have doctors that, when I go for a visit, other doctors come in just to see me because they saw me basically on my deathbed um, at the hospital, you know, dying of COVID. But your story went viral across the nation. How did that happen? Yeah, my wife, she, uh, sorry. My wife, she stepped up to the plate. She was talking to a lady and the lady's like, listen, you need to tell your story. Go on Facebook, just do a live, just get it out. Just talk about it, it'll help you. It'll help you heal inside. And um, again, she's not the type of person that will do that, but she did. She went on Facebook and she did a, a plea just asking for prayers and, and just support and it went viral. Um, somebody from the news saw it, another person from the news saw it and it just went literally worldwide. Um, we've been in, I've done interviews in Australia, UK, Canada, South America, all over Europe, um, all over the United States and the news would mix it around. We'd get headlines like 20 year old son almost kills his father in South Florida father wakes up, um, kicks his son out of the house. And this, you know, it's just very harsh. Luckily for my son, he doesn't follow social media. On the same time, there were some that were very compassionate and open to know what Nicholas's feelings are. You know, is he okay? Because this is a lot to go through, you know, in your mind thinking that maybe you could have killed your dad. He was just so happy that I was alive. COVID-19 is extremely isolating. You and I had a conversation about a particular nurse that really... Oh, sorry. <laughs> You're get me going. It really moved me. So do you want to tell that story? When I woke up, I didn't, again, I didn't know I was at a hospital. I didn't know where I was. I, I mean, I have memories of, of just being in a weird place. Um, everybody's in spacesuits. I thought I was in a scary movie, like a, a horror movie, really, because I didn't know where I was. Nobody would talk to me because I was COVID in an ICU unit. So anytime I'd yell for help or try to yell for help, you know, nobody would answer me. I'd see them look in at me, but never, like, they wouldn't come in. I had nurses that were horrible. There's things they did to me that I couldn't believe they did and they shouldn't have done. And then there were some that were super compassionate. And I remember there was one nurse. There was one nurse that came and she was there to either clean me or do something. I don't even remember, but all I remember is asking her is if she would just hold my hand. And not only did she hold my hand, but she held me. She sang to me. She, um, she made me feel special and uh, I needed that more than like anything at that time. Because again, I haven't seen my family already in a month and a half. I couldn't walk. I had to learn how to walk again. I couldn't use my, my hands. In fact, the only thing I could use, my left elbow from my elbow to here is the only movement I had. I couldn't scoot around. I couldn't roll. Um, I could lift my head barely. Legs didn't work. Body didn't work. Um, I have no, even today, I have no feeling in these fingers at all. Here you are now out of the hospital. You have close to a million dollars in medical bills. I'm guessing you have some type of insurance. How are you managing that? When I got sick, I found out my insurance was nothing. It did absolutely nothing. So luckily we were able to upgrade to like the premium super insurance that they had, which is like $1,300 a month just for me. That doesn't count anybody else, just for me. We got our first stack of bills in one envelope that was 260 something pages. And that one was for, yeah, $906,000. And then every week or two, we get more and more that come in. So right now, I think we're up to about 950,000, 960,000. It's pretty much a million dollars. Might as well be, like you said. Um, it's paying for most of it, but I still have probably about $250,000 of medical bills that I have to pay on my own. Imagine people that don't have any insurance at all like they would have to pay a million dollars or close to a million dollars or maybe more than a million dollars for getting sick, which some people say is fake. Um, I've had people calling me uh, a government actor, a crisis actor. How's everyone now? How's your wife? How are your, how's your son Nicholas? How's your three other children? They're good, they're good. I mean, I made it out, I'm, I'm here. So they're, uh, they're good, everything's 
pretty much back to normal except for my physical, you know, things. You know, I, I have to go to physical therapy three days a week for my legs and arms and shoulders. Then I have to go to physical therapy now two days a week for my hand. So that's five days a week of physical therapy. You know, I'm, I'm exhausted. I'm so tired. Biggest takeaway of 2020 for you? Don't take life for granted. If you are feeling a little bit sick, stay away from people. Go to the doctor, get checked. It can save your life. It can save your family's lives. What does a pint-sized influencer and the president of Broward College have in common? They both made our list. Find out why. Fashion critic, model, style star, seven years old? Excuse me, was that a typo? No, it wasn't. That's the actual full description of Taylin Biggs. Now, before the fame, she was an unknown nine-month-old who was posted on Instagram by Fashion Kids, which gave Taylin her big break. Taylin became the first model to be picked up through social media for Kardashian Kids, a children's clothing line owned by Kim, Khloe, and Kourtney Kardashian. Now, she rubs shoulders with the most loved celebrities and regularly struts down the runway at A-list fashion events where she's been labeled the pint-sized Anna Wintour by People Magazine for her show-stopping ensembles and her sharp-as-nails fashion breakdowns. Whether you like it or not, social media has changed the world and not many embody that change more than Taylin Biggs. You have over 200,000 followers on Instagram. Yeah, I do. Do you know that's a big deal? Yes, it's a very big deal. So what do you want to say to all those people out there that are following you on Instagram? I say I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you guys. <laughs> um, I say I'm doing new things, so you better watch out. <laughs> Taylor, how did this all happen, your career at such a young age? When I was 18 months, the Kardashians called me to go all the way to California to do a shoot for them, for their collection. What does your sister, who's two years younger than you, think about your career? She loves it. She call, tells me, hey, Tay Tay, um, I love your, um, what you do. And I say, well, thanks. <laughs> Yeah, that's what she says about my career. Can you tell us about your little brother and your little sister? Are they gonna follow you in showbiz? Oh, my sister has a page on Instagram. It's Alea Biggs. She likes to do fashion. Uh, she loves doing fashion, but sometimes she doesn't, she gets scared when she goes on the camera, but she wants to do the same things. But when I open the doors, she can do anything she wants. <laughs> Does she get that from you? Taylor and I have always wanted to go to Fashion Week, okay? New York Fashion Week is the best one, and you go all the time. I think you've been six times, so what is it like? It's so much fun for me. It's, it's a cool thing. You get to take photos, you get to do the runway, you get to you get to watch the runway, you get to see celebrities, you get to have fun. What's your favorite part? My favorite part is meeting celebrities. <laughs> What's your favorite celebrity that you've met at New York Fashion Week? Cardi. I get nervous if I have to walk a runway, so it's not something that I would want to do, but you kill it. So how do you not get nervous? I'm brave, confident, and never give up. I feel a different person when I'm on a runway walk because when, like, when it's all those people out there watching you, you feel like a different person when you're walking. Who's your stylist? My stylist, her name is Delasia. She like kills my hair. She does so good. I think she does, does amazing. My mom too. They both do good. Let's talk about your outfit. What are you wearing? I'm um, lacking furred, and I'm wearing Stella the Cart Me, and I'm wearing Jordans and a little bit of stars to make it fashionable. You are more fashionable than me. I don't even have Stella McCartney. That is what? a gorgeous, I don't, that is a gorgeous jacket. I know, it's, it's a fashion travesty, isn't it? Don't report me to the fashion police, okay? Oh, <laughs> I would never. Thank you. 
I heard that you are getting into acting and that you can cry on cue. What do you like about acting? I love acting. It's a great thing to do and I get to be different people. And I also heard that Hollywood has been asking you to move to Los Angeles, but you said you want to stay put in South Florida because you love it so much. So what do you love so much about Florida? Florida is a nice place and it's hot. I like hot. You get to go in the pool. You get to uh, play outside. The beach is my most, 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 most favorite. Taylin, you've accomplished so much in the seven years that you've been on this planet. What's going to happen with the next seven? What do you want to do? I want to design. I want to have my own hairline. I want to have my own makeup line, my own clothes line, and acting. You know why I want to do all that stuff? Tell us. If I'm doing working, I make money, right? I make money. I want to be a fashion superhero to help people get houses, food. Do you have advice for other little girls out there or even little boys that want to be future style stars like you? If you want to be a boss, you need to be confident, have girl power, and the only thing you have to know, never ever give up. George Floyd's death sparked a reckoning in America that is shedding a light on systematic racism plaguing many aspects of our society, including in education. Now our next guest, Gregory Hale, has dedicated his life to higher education. He's a first generation college graduate who went on to earn a law degree from Columbia University and now serves as a president of Broward College, overseeing 63,000 students and 5,000 employees. President Hale delivered a poignant speech in June denouncing hate to a 74% minority student body as violence erupted in the streets across the U.S. over Floyd's death. Now Hale spoke of his respect for law enforcement and a deep appreciation for his best friend, an NYPD officer, while also detailing how he has been victimized by police in the past himself and makes sure to hug his family close when he leaves home in case he never sees them again. Let's take it from the top. You grew up in Queens in the mid 80s. So describe your living situation and what you saw as a child. South Jamaica, Queens is, is not a place that I would suggest you'd want to grow up, unfortunately, particularly during that time, which was at the height of the crack epidemic. I've experienced a lot of things as a child that I would never wish upon my beautiful daughters who are nine and five years old. But at the same time, I don't want to lose sight of those experiences. Your mom, a postal worker for many years, she did have to lie, you know, to get you to a better school and a better district. So how has that shaped your view of education? I even remember as a child uh, seeing um, a vial on the floor, on the ground, and you would see those in puddles, and those are things that you would just see. And, uh, and so I would uh, walk uh, through the projects, and then I would get on the bus, and I'd get on that bus for 45 minutes, another 10 or so minutes walking there. And all of a sudden, you're in a different, completely different environment and you're recognizing that the children talk differently or they wear different clothes and they have very different backgrounds than you do. I will tell you though, when you're coming back, you feel the difference, right? Because you know it's not going to be the same as where you were. And so in one day, you're getting to see what is great about our public school system, about certain communities, yet a few hours later, you're recognizing very quickly how bad it can be and how even your demeanor has to change and the consciousness about what's going on around you is heightened depending on the community that you're in. Those are things that I had to learn. Describe your mom. So my mom is amazing. Um, she, uh, as you mentioned, she worked at the post office for over 30 years. She never missed a day of work. She went whenever she could. She took overtime whenever she could. And, uh, and I always recognized um, how hard of a worker she was and she would get these uh, plaques that she would bring home um, for never missing a day of work. And so her work ethic was incredible. And it was a very challenging community, but you would never know by way of her poise. Um, she was always the kindest person. Um, she would be challenged. And when those situations occurred, she would reveal that you should never mistake kindness for weakness. Well, let's fast forward to college. So now you've graduated top 15% of your class. 
and you go to Arizona State University, which is pretty far yeah. from New York, and you went sight unseen. The truth is, I didn't know that you were supposed to visit colleges before you actually attended, let alone a college that was 2,500 miles away from my home. Talk to you about being uh, the first in my family to go to college and graduate from college. Um, very basic principles of being a good student. I didn't know how to study, right? People take that for granted. I remember reading an article and it said, what you take in one hour before you go to bed, you're likely to retain. And because I was, I, I was so new to the idea of, of trying to be a great student, I took that information and I said, okay, I know what I'll do. I will read for an hour before I go to bed at night. And then I'll set my clock so that I can go to sleep and wake up an hour later. And so I would go to sleep, wake up an hour later, and then read for an hour, and then sleep for an hour, and read for an hour, and sleep for an hour, and I would do so on and so forth, and I would do that for an entire semester. My first semester, I did horrible without that technique. The next semester, I actually did pretty well. Now, for any students watching, or future students, I do not recommend it at all. Everybody has a favorite teacher in their life and you met a professor that changed the way that you view your own capabilities. What happened? I remember I had a professor named James Jarrett at Arizona State University. I'll never forget when I had done a paper for him and uh, after class uh, he gave me my paper and he pulled me aside and he said, I want to tell you that I think you're the best student that I've ever had. And when he said that to me, um, it validated my ability to succeed in that environment and any environment thereafter. Well, you did go on to get a law degree from prestigious Columbia University, practice corporate litigation, and then you moved into higher education. How diverse is Broward College? As diverse as it could be. Um, we have about 63,000 students. 37% of our students are Hispanic, about 30% of our students are black. We have 150 countries of origin represented among our student body. We have 50 languages spoken among our student body. We have economic diversity. Uh, we have students from every corner of the earth who are here, who have decided this is the place that they want to be to make a difference. You gave a poignant speech publicly denouncing the death of George Floyd, but you also spoke about your best friend in New York, who is a New York City police officer. Why was it important for you to do that? One of the things that I shared um, was that my very best friend, one who I went to high school with um, of more than 25 years, is a law enforcement officer in New York City. And I love him like a brother. And I cherish the work he does. I think it's absolutely amazing. And I cherish the work of our law enforcement officers. And I think about the times that I was growing up and that I needed them and they were there for me. I think about our own Public Safety Institute that trains law enforcement officers in Broward County and the leaders that come through that institute. And I cherish their existence. Uh, and I also know what is true in the world and that there are occasions like the George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the so many names that exist that have been subject of undue harm that should have never happened. Those two things can be true. I can love law enforcement and recognize that there are some challenges. You did have a difficult conversation after a difficult year with your youngest daughter, and you had mentioned that she had said, or she had asked you, if black people are still slaves. So what was going through your head, and how did you respond? You know, my daughters are, are wonderfully brilliant. One of their favorite American heroes um, is Harriet Tubman. What was going through my head, she was taking what she had learned about Harriet Tubman, taking what she was learning about the George Floyd experience, and having a hard time seeing the difference. I would be honest if I didn't tell you that that was painful to hear her attempt to reconcile her understanding of history and what was happening at that moment. What do you think your biggest accomplishment will be as a president of Broward College? There should be no community that defines its opportunity to pursue a quality education by the wealth that a family has, by the income that a family has, by the zip code that a community or that an individual lives in. 
Those are the challenges relating to the inequality of opportunity that frankly we exist to defy, that we exist to overcome. We don't get to walk away from those challenges. We embrace them, this college has embraced them, and by that way, that, by that work, we've been able to engage those communities like we never have in the history of this institution. The godfather of Miami nightlife turned humanitarian, and we reveal our most fascinating of 2020. You don't want to miss it. Miami's nightlife scene conjures images of sex, money, and wild times. Not necessarily a place for a child. But as a teenager, Michael Capone was at the center of it all, building up South Beach's late night entertainment. But Michael's journey hasn't been all glitz and glamour. Having to overcome a serious drug addiction and homeless on the streets of New York by his early 20s, and later in life, narrowly surviving a freak speedboat crash. The former nightclub guru, endless co-founder, and celebrated real estate developer isn't your typical success story. He not only turned things around for himself, he works tirelessly to improve the lives of others through his expansive humanitarian work in our community and around the globe, which is why he makes our list of the seven most fascinating people of South Florida. Well, I always say, that uh, if you ask me what's the worst thing that ever happened to me in my life, I would tell you that, you know, I lost everything at a really young age. I had a major drug addiction, had brain tumors. You know, I crashed and burned, I lost my dad, like all in this small, short period of time. And if you ask me what's the best thing that ever happened to you in your life, I'd say the exact same thing. You moved from Belgium to Miami when you were six years old. You know, when I first got here, everybody made fun of me. I was like a little French boy, and I was dressed differently. And what were your parents like? My father was a world champion swimmer. He swam the English Channel twice, and had restaurants and nightclubs, actually. And my mom was an interior decorator, worked with my father. You were in British Vogue as the who's who in Miami at 19 years old. And you also had a cover story, Miami New Times, I think it was early 90s, where you had said that being in the nightlife as a promoter was like being on a tightrope. Explain that. Mickey Rourke back then was one of the, uh, you know, big celebrities of that epoch, of that era. And I remember when I got like that New Times article or something, he pulled me to the side and he said, let me tell you something. Don't ever believe your own press. He's like, because you'll see, it'll be the end of you. It comes a time when there's so much attention on you that you just lose your mind. You know, we were always experimenting with um, cooler drugs when we were young, you know, mushrooms and LSD and things like that. And then uh, heroin came along and it was something that I tried. And I think uh, probably within six months to nine months, you know, I developed a major addiction. Weren't you homeless at one point in New York? While I was in New York, I ended up spending uh, know, like 45 days basically pretty much homeless and staying in like little, you know, street hotels and things like that. In the winter? Surviving yeah, in a blizzard. I watched how homeless people actually live. I got to like be that for a little bit, you know, especially the ones with, with big drug addictions. And it definitely marked me forever. You know, I had a good family in Europe and they eventually got me out of there. They sent me to Belgium and, you know, I got in uh, a really good program right away. Um, and from that moment on, I never, ever, ever touched the recreational drug. I mean, when I came back, I was really welcomed. Everywhere I went, I would, you know, I had barely any money and, you know, I'd go to a restaurant. People were like, oh, it's okay. We love what you did for Miami, you know. And everyone was copying me, and everyone really, really like helped me get back on my feet. And then uh, Chad Oppenheim and uh, Ilona, uh, they were building a building called Ted Museum Park, which is where I live. And um, they said, you know, why don't you promote this building? And I was like, well, it's going to be hard for me to promote it if I don't have any stake in it, because otherwise, you know. So. We figured out something, so they made me like a co-developer on the brochure. We sold the building out in nine days. So from there, I got a little bit of money, and I invested in some real estate. The first thing I did is 
do a giant fundraiser. And that was like my comeback project uh, for the victims of the Kosovo relief. Yeah, so I ended up on the board of United Way. I got, you know, s some good, you know, uh, experience by doing that. We worked together. The Haiti earthquake happened. Something happened to me on that trip that was like extremely profound. It was very, very heavy. What was it about Haiti? The level of poverty that I would see, right, and the amount that you can change someone's life there with such, you know, a few dollars. And then, you know, being in Haiti on like Saturday afternoon, flying in Saturday on the last flight, changing, going to your nightclub and watching, you know, a guy, you know, spray, you know, $5,000 worth of champagne in the air and you're like, woo, you know, it, you, you start seeing it differently. You know, and after a while, it was like, whoa, you know, something's not right with this picture. This year has been one of the hardest years of pretty much all of our lives, but that hasn't stopped you. So briefly list all the missions that Jem has been on just in 2020 alone. So we started um, with the Australia wildfires. We went to three different states throughout the whole entire country, driving everywhere, distributing uh, cash cards, which is a program we have through Bethany Frankel's, you know, Be Strong. As soon as I got back, there was these tornadoes that went through uh, Tennessee. So I flew over there. By the time I was in Tennessee, the pandemic was officially you know, announced as a pandemic. And we came back to Miami and Bethany and I started working on you know, a really major initiative for COVID. Then there was this, uh, you know, all the riots and everything that was happening. We felt bad for some of the lower income business owners, right? That like got their businesses destroyed. So we started helping the ones that didn't have insurance. All the while we're still in the Bahamas because of Dorian, which happened a year prior. And we had committed to rebuilding about 200 homes there and rebuilding three schools. What's yeah. the biggest misconception about you? You know, I think people evolve sometimes your public image may not, you know, catch up to you, right, in the same time that you want it to be, right? So there's still many people out in Miami that are like, oh, Michael Capone, oh, yeah, hey, did you just wake up at noon now? How's the nightclubs? Ha, ha, ha. You do have a new love in your life, Zoe Robbins. Mm -hmm. So tell us how you guys met. Fate. Zoe's incredible. We met at um, the Make-A-Wish ball last year. And... Um, her mom actually introduced us. We had met before. We spoke for a few hours, and her mom told her in the car on the way back from Make-A-Wish, you're going to marry him, you'll see. And, uh, and then Zoe and I met the next day, and then we've been together ever since. You have done so much, but you're still so young. You're only 48, right? You're in the prime of your life. So what's next for Michael Capone? To be really good at something, you really need to focus on it. Uh, at least with the way my mind works. So I kind of walked away from the private sector for this time period. And I want to build up, you know, GEM to being, you know, one of the world's largest disaster orgs, which I think we're doing a pretty good job of it. She's an award-winning actress, and he's a three-time NBA champion. They are incredibly accomplished on their own, but together they're unstoppable. The spot at the top of our 2020 most fascinating list won't be going to a single person this year, but rather a remarkable couple who is using their talents to not only enrich South Florida, but the world. Now, Dwayne Wade and Gabrielle Union tied the knot in an extravagant Miami ceremony six years ago, the second marriage for both. Part of what also makes them so appealing is an openness and willingness to share their personal struggles with the world early miscarriages, some through from IVF and some just, you know, naturally, you know, happening on our own. How many miscarriages did you have? I, literally, that's why I lost track. It's, it's somewhere like eight or nine, give or take. Wade has proudly stated that being a dad is his number one job. He already had four kids, including an adopted nephew, when he met Union, but the couple struggled to have children of their own. It just feels like a lot of shame, just years of shame and humiliation and betrayal of your body and, and uh, so many emotions. 
actually not a problem getting pregnant, it was holding the baby. Now their daughter, Kavia James, was born by surrogate in 2018. To have her in this moment is all worth it, you know, all the sacrifice, uh, a lot for my wife. The Wades showed just how important love, acceptance, and family is to them again earlier this year when their then 12-year-old son, Zion, came out as transgender and asked to change her name to Zaya. What's the point of being on this earth if you're going to try to be someone you're not? It's like you're not even living as yourself. As, as parents, we put our hopes and we put our fears on our kids. Right. And with Zaya, we decided to, to listen to her what every you know every parent should be is what you're being right now which is unconditionally loving your child and supporting you. your child in whoever they are now they are staunch advocates for lgbtq rights now union graced another major magazine cover this year time alongside her husband the magazine named the couple in their list of the 100 most influential people calling them champions for change Dwayne Wade and Gabrielle Union are a 2020 power couple showing us that good can prevail and love conquers all. It's why they top our list of the seven most fascinating people in South Florida. Poppy, we are so excited to have you as one of our seven most fascinating people of South Florida. Take me back to Brooklyn. What was it like growing up in a conservative Jewish household? And where did you get the nickname Poppy from? Uh, what were you doing before you came here to Miami? How's that steak? How about the Wagyu double stack? Have you had that one? The schnitzel? The gefilte fish with caviar on top? How about the manapo potato? Manapotato? Poppy. What was that phone call like when we had to tell you that you were going to be one of our seven most fascinating people? What were you thinking? What went through your head? Can someone get this guy to give me an answer? This is ridiculous. Or can I get a bone in? Jeez. 